In this video, we'll discuss the First Cold War. We call this the First Cold War because the Cold War itself, which goes on to 1991, was interrupted by a period of detente, which we'll talk about later. In this lecture, we'll look at the United States and the battle against communism from the end of World War II to about 1961. What do we mean by the term Cold War? The term was first used uh, right after the war was over, although it had been used several times before by different authors. A book in 1947 by Walter Lippmann called The Cold War, A Study in U.S. Foreign Policy, popularized the term. What was the Cold War? Well, it was an ideological battle. It was the United States versus the Soviet Union, the United Soviet Socialist Republic, and their form of communism versus America's capitalism. It was different in the fact that it was a proxy war. The two combatants, the USA and the USSR, never actually engaged in direct battle like you would have in other wars. Instead, they fought through proxies. These were other nations either on the side of the United States or on the side of communism. And it was largely ideological and economical. It was about economic and military control over these other nations and the world at large. And the weapons we were using in this new kind of war was the threat of mutually assured destruction, that our weapons were big enough and powerful enough as your weapons, and so that together to prevent a nuclear catastrophe around the world, the fact that we could destroy each other, we'll just not fight. It was fought through propaganda as well, and economics were used as weapons. It has long roots, too. The United States, in the early 1900s, intervened after World War I in the Russian Revolution. We came in on the side of the white Russians. The United States refused to recognize the Bolsheviks and their new nation that they call the United Soviet Socialist Republic. And so this had led to a long and deep-seated animosity between the U.S. and Russia. And so in World War II, when we were nominally allies with the Russians, afterwards, that alliance started to devolve. Uh, we saw this at Yalta. We saw uh, the question of how they were going to divide Germany and Europe following the war uh, was a major source of concern. There was the Potsdam Conference where Truman uh, meets with Stalin and already there is distrust building there. And then after the war is over, the USSR did not ratify some agreements that the United States had put forward, like the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreements that sets up the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and Russia opposed both of those initiatives. After the war, you also see Russia coming out against the United States' plan for atomic security. The Baruch Plan of 1946 was an idea that they would set up international control of atomic weapons. And the United States, remember, had bombed Japan with two atomic weapons. And when we said that maybe there needed to be some oversight over this, Russia was opposed to it. We also saw problems with the Iran crisis. Uh, the Russians had promised to withdraw from Iran and let them hold elections, but instead they continued to occupy northern Iran. Uh, and this was a violation of a Tehran declaration in 1943, and there were some attempts to pressure concessions for oil from Iran. And then we see... Uh, more particularly the United States' interest at large, was the Turkish Straits Conference. The United States uh, was supporting Turkey and Greece as well. Greece was going through a civil war at the time, and Russia took advantage of this to try to pressure Turkey to give it permission to use the Dardanelles and the Bosporus Straits that connected the Black Sea and the Mediterranean so that Russia would have access to the Mediterranean through the Black Sea, through the Straits at Istanbul, and further south in Turkey. 
And this caused a, a lot of concern, especially because it threatened Greece and the civil war that they were having uh, and the fear that communists would take over both Turkey and Greece. Shortly thereafter, the United States begins on a policy of containment. Now, this uh, is largely attributed to a so-called long telegram and the X article written by a senior diplomat in Russia named George Kennan. Kennan, an American diplomat, was asked why the Soviets opposed the World Bank. And so he writes in this so-called long telegram an explanation of what he sees as Soviet paranoia. Later on, an article evolves. It's published in Foreign Affairs magazine called The Sources of Soviet Conduct. And this article uh, says that the Soviets are paranoid. And this paranoia uh, is mixed with an idea that they also want to expand worldwide, that communism should erupt around the globe. And so you've got this one side of them that is paranoid of outsiders, another side that wants to become worldwide. And so he says the best way to deal with Russia is to develop, quote, a policy of firm containment designed to confront the Russians, unquote. In other words, don't let communism expand anywhere it isn't already. This leads to the Truman Doctrine. The president came up with this in a speech where he announced that he was going to assist Greece and Turkey with $400 million to help them preserve democracy. The United States also wanted to help Europe recover. Secretary of State George C. Marshall gave a speech at Harvard University in June of 1947. In this speech, he laid out the plan, the European Recovery Program, that would pump billions and billions of dollars over the next several years into Europe. And what this money was going to do was help the European nations rebuild themselves and to provide some economic and political stability so that you won't have things like fascism or communism, these isms, these unstabilizing political movements gaining traction again in Europe. The USSR was against this and instead a few years later launched its own plan called the Molotov Plan. And this was for countries in the Russian sphere who were not going to participate in the Marshall Plan, but this was Russia's way of helping them stabilize. In 1948, in June, Berlin, which was in the eastern section of the city, and you had a long road that led from the western section through the eastern section into Berlin, which itself was divided. Because of problems between the USSR and the Allies, Russia cut access along that road into the Soviet zone from West Berlin. And so divided Germany was divided even more because it was cut off. And to prevent starvation and to prevent the people in Berlin from not getting food in Western Berlin, the United States and the Allies organized airlifts. And so they would send in planes with supplies to come in because the road was inaccessible. What we see as a result of this is a further division in Germany between the Western Federal Republic and the Eastern German Democratic Republic. And this division goes on until the 1990s. So you have two alliances that form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO alliance, which was the United States and their allies, versus the Soviet Union and her Warsaw Pact allies. Another major setback for the United States in its containment theory was the loss of China. Now, this had been coming for some time. There had been revolutions going on before World War II, between the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese com uh, communists. And so this continues again after the war from 1946 to 1949. And finally, on October the 1st of 49, the communists take control. The Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalists, flee to the island of Formosa, which they rename Taiwan. And so you have Mao Zedong in charge of China and Chiang Kai-shek in charge of Taiwan. As a result of this, National Security Council Memo Number 68, April 1950, NSC 68 as it's popularly called, urged a massive 
amount of money be diverted to the military defense budget. And what they hoped to do was to start a military buildup to confront communism, to basically enact the Truman Doctrine, to fight communism wherever it occurred. And so you see Truman's defense spending increase almost three times between the years of 1950 to 1953. In Korea, an incident breaks out that challenges the idea of containment again. Korea had been divided at the 38th parallel after the war. And so in the north, you had the Soviet-backed Democratic People's Republic. Kim Il-sung was the leader of the northern Korean state. In the south, Sigmund Rhee, an American-educated Korean, ran the Republic of Korea. In June of 1950, North Korea, again backed by the Soviet Union, not China, invades the south almost to the very bottom of the peninsula. And then finally, there's a counteroffensive. UN tr- forces under U.S. General Douglas MacArthur are able to retake Korea, and they begin pushing all the way up to the China border at the Yalu River. Now, what they met up there were hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops waiting. And so they made the decision to pull back and to retreat. Now, General MacArthur and Truman did not get along, did not see eye to eye, and because of some things that MacArthur did and said in April of 1951, Truman relieves MacArthur of command. Uh, He essentially fires him. MacArthur comes, uh, eventually runs against Truman for the presidency and loses, and then, uh, as he said, like the old soldier, he was just going to fade away. Yet he remained very active in politics and was a critic of the president. In 1953, an armistice is signed, and that armistice is still in effect. Korea is still divided. In Vietnam, this was another uh, peninsula that Japan had occupied during World War II. It had been a French colony for a couple of hundred years. But when the Japanese occupied, we allied ourselves with the Nationalists and their leader, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had been leading a revolution against French colonial control and also during the war against the Japanese. While he was fighting the Japanese, he was our ally. But when France came back to Indochina, as the region was called, following World War II, the United States began backing France. In 1954, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French colonial forces are defeated. And you see this marked on your map. It's up in the northeastern province of Vietnam. And so when the French leave and pull out because they can no longer stay there, after this defeat, the United States takes control of maintaining Vietnam. And we divide the country at the 17th parallel. In the north, you have Ho Chi Minh's nationalists. And in the south, the United States supports Emperor Bao Dai. In the United States, as a result of the Cold War, you do see a culture of fear. And we normally think about this uh, represented by Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin and this idea of McCarthyism. It originates uh, when McCarthy gave a speech in February of 1950 in West Virginia at the Wheeling, West Virginia Women's Republican Club. And in this speech, uh, at some point, he pulls out of his pocket a list, he says, of 200 known communists working in the State Department. Now, this number changed, and he repeated this speech numerous times over the next several years, always talking about this number or that number. The numbers always changed of supposed communists working. Well, they had never really been any identified. Nobody ever saw his list, and what most people did think was it was just a blank envelope or a blank piece of paper he had that he pulled out for effect. But as a result of this, in 1950, Congress passes the McCarran Internal Security Act, which identifies a list of subversive organizations. Some of them uh, ties to communists, others ties to fascist organizations. Although in July of 1950, 
uh, the Senate committee, the Tidings Committee, investigated, and this is what they said about McCarthy and his tactics. They said that it was a fraud and a hoax perpetrated on the Senate of the United States and on the American people. They represent perhaps the most nefarious campaign of half-truths and untruth in the history of this republic. And yet many people believed what McCarthy was saying, and they believed that communism was uh, on the brink of taking over the republic. And so when McCarthy uh, continued to blame people and investigate people, uh, his investigations took on great importance for some people. And finally, in April and June of 1954, he went after the army to suggest that the army was being too soft and not doing their part to help contain communism. Uh, After this, his popularity dropped, uh, and he was eventually, by the end of the year, censured by the Senate. But McCarthyism wasn't just all Joseph McCarthy. It had a long history in the United States. There had been a Communist Party in the United States following World War I. However, by the 1930s, things happened in Russia. There were purges where uh, people who didn't agree with Joseph Stalin uh, were disappeared. Uh, And uh, then when on the brink of World War II, on the eve of World War II, when the Soviet Union and Germany signed a non-aggression treaty, this really began whittling away at the American membership because a lot of people no longer supported, uh, a lot of communists in the United States no longer supported the Soviet Union, so they began looking at other ways. But again, communism had grown popular during the Great Depression because many people believed capitalism had failed them. In 1938, towards the end of the Great Depression, the American Congress in the House starts the Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, as it's sometimes known. Uh, It was led by a Texas congressman named Martin Dyes. In 1947, after the war is over, they look at Hollywood and the movie industry, uh, and they ask Hollywood's executives and leading actors and union members to name names. Now, they never had any really good evidence that people were communists. What they had were rumor and innuendo, and they went with that. And so, since they didn't have any hard facts, they were asking people, well, can you identify other communists. Well, if you wanted to get off, you name names. But a group of about 10 or 11 Hollywood people decided not to. Some of them were actors, others were directors or producers who would not cooperate with the committee. They became known as the Hollywood 10. And they and others who were singled out were blacklisted. That meant that they would not be hired in Hollywood. So many lost their jobs. Uh, Some committed suicide. uh, And this was not just in Hollywood, but across the United States. This idea of blacklisting people who weren't cooperating, weren't naming names. In 1948, this moved into the government realm. Uh, Whitaker Chambers, who was a journalist, accused a State Department employee named a diplomat named Alger Hisk, of being soft on communism. And Whitaker said, well, I know because I was a spy. And Hiss, uh, who was working with the Manhattan Project, the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, was passing papers to me, and I was passing them on to my Soviet contact. I put these in a pumpkin out in a field in New York, and he would pick them up. And so these so-called pumpkin papers became known Uh, became the name for Passing Secrets. Now, in 1949, in September of that year, Russians also detonated an atomic weapon. And so many Americans began to wonder, how could this be? And rather than understanding that this was an issue that scientists had been working on for many years, long before the war started, and so in the scientific community, they, in their journals and other magazines, had been sharing data about the possibility of splitting the atom uh, and the amount of power that that would con- release, uh, had been wa- working on these pro- problems for many, many years. But we began to think that instead of reading journals and uh, going to conferences, as scientists do, and learning from each other, that there must have been spying involved for uh, Russians to get this 
information. But as we know today, the Japanese were also working on atomic weapons during World War II, as were the Germans. That's how we found out about them, because some German scientists, most especially Albert Einstein, who was working on this problem, when he left the uh, when he left Germany under the Nazis, he brought the information to the United States and told the president about it. And then that's when we started our own project to develop atomic energy. But Klaus Fuchs, a British scientist, uh, a German scientist in Great Britain who admitted that he was passing secrets, implicated an American couple named Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Now, it was really Julius Rosenberg who worked on the Manhattan Project, uh, who probably was a spy and was passing secrets to Fuchs and others. But his wife, Ethel, there's no evidence that she was actually involved. Her crime was she was married to Julius. And what prosecutors said is they were pressing charges against her to get Julius Rosenberg to spill the beans, to talk about his involvement. Uh, eventually, they're both convicted of espionage, largely on circumstantial evidence. They're the only two Americans who ever tried for treason during the war, during the Cold War, uh, and they were both executed in 1953. In 1953, that same year, playwright Arthur Miller wrote a book about what was going on with McCarthyism and with this culture of fear that the Cold War engendered, and he entitled it The Crucible. And so he drew a parallel between the Salem witch trials of the 1600s and the Cold War and the fear of McCarthyism and the idea that you could try and convict and put people to death on the flimsiest of evidence in that play. We also turn to God, and as your book talks about, uh, more and more people are turning to religion during the 1950s, attending church, and so uh, also in that time we were looking to put our faith in a higher power, we decided to print in God We Trust on the back of all paper money. So this is just some examples of how the Cold War, both politically, economically, and militarily, and culturally, affected us in the United States.